non-voting member, and a time has come that we need to finally join so that we have free-flowing free information uh, between the states about uh, juveniles that may be moving into our state. Thank you. Okay. We have questions for the presenter? <coughs> Representative Quick. Uh, Representative Pack, so help me help you. Uh, if you've got somebody that can maybe tell us briefly the problems that Georgia is experiencing, the problem this is designed to fix, so that when people start asking about the cost, we can explain the benefits to them. If there's somebody that can give us that, I would like to hear not a lengthy presentation, but maybe a bullet point of the high highlights. Certainly. I have, I have actually many witnesses here. Judge, would you mind? Um, okay. gotcha. Yes. My name is Steve Tesco, Chief Judge of Clayton County. I'm also chair of the Oversight and Implementation Committee of the Criminal Justice Reform Commission. I'm also here in the capacity of uh, representing the current president of the Council of Juvenile Court Judges, uh, Judge Robin Scherer. Uh, council supports this and has also sent a letter to the governor in support. To answer your uh, question, in a nutshell, it's like this. It's, it, it compromises the health and uh, the, the community safety, uh, citizens in the state by virtue of the fact that uh, we have kids who are coming into the state of Georgia who are committing crimes. And, um, and as a result uh, of that, depending upon the seriousness of the crime, um, judges are not able to get those kids back to those states and so by default are having to commit those kids to our state facilities where we are now expending the cost to hold them okay so we're basically babysitting these kids uh, when we without the interstate compact being a member of it we can't get those kids back to the state and have that state deal with those kids the the other uh, uh, problem we have is when um, you know, one other footnote to that. Given what we have done, y'all have done <laughs> last year in reforming the juvenile justice system, which is to reduce the number of commitments to the state of your lower risk offenders, the problem is, is it's counterproductive. Um, in fact, we do know that there's a cost to this because with the help of Joe Hood and OPB, we, uh, we reached out to him early last year uh, to take a look the best we can at the numbers of these kids that are going in and it is counterproductive cost-wise in terms of public safety as well. So we do have kids that are coming in doing that. We also have kids that are coming in um, that we are not supervising. They have, we have kids, for example, that are going to visit their parent in another state, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent. They commit a crime there, all right? And so some of these judges are saying, hey, um, he's not our problem, okay? And they send him to the state of Georgia back home, um, and they're not being supervised. And, and, and so that's, a, that's another risk to the community. So in a nutshell, those are the big problems. But that, that specific cost on an annual basis has not been quantified, or do you have an estimate just in ballpark numbers? I think there's an estimate, um, but it's like one. It's 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 okay. really kind of difficult to get. Um, so torn. I mean, see, see, the problem is, is that depending upon. Well, let me let me. I what we do know is that if, if it's a kid that we have to put in secure in a secure facility, we're looking at ninety thousand a year. Okay. If we have a kid that we put in residential placement, which is a straight commitment. We're looking at fifty-four thousand dollars a year. All right, so you could do some numbers on that alone. All right, if you're looking at maybe just twenty kids times ninety thousand or fifty-four thousand. Um, but okay. I happen to know there's a lot more kids just in my jurisdiction alone, being in the Metro Atlanta area, that I get kids who end up coming before my court that I find out got in trouble in another state while visiting a relative, all right, and who otherwise would have, would have been in my court under supervision through a transfer through interstate compact. And I, I'm just telling you, there's, there, it's, w w within an annual year, a calendar year, it's, it's quite a few, just in my jurisdiction alone. Thank you. Just to follow up, Representative Quick, 
my conversation with the department, uh, they believe that actually joining the compact may actually have cost savings going forward. So it, it's a revenue benefit, I guess. Um, it's better than a revenue neutral type of bill. And, and, and Representative Pack, that's just what I want to be able to tell everyone. Right. And what part of the problem is they don't know who they need to send back, or what, so they can't really calculate that figure for you. Thank you. Okay. Where is it? Oh, I see him now. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for the presenter or for Judge Teske? Okay, uh, we'll close off. Well, we have anybody else here to speak on the bill? Anybody signed up down there? Just Judge Tusky. Okay. All right. Well, we'll close off input on the bill, public input on the bill, and the bill is now in the breast of the committee. Uh, do I have a motion? A motion do pass and second. Is there any uh, any other is there any amendments or any other motions related to this bill? Chair, call the question on House Bill 989. Excuse me, 898. <laughs> LC 295840ER. Uh, all those in favor uh, of motion do pass. Signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. Passes unanimously. Thank you. If I could, we're going to call up um, bill number. House Bill 674, Representative Welch, and you can present it from where you sit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what we have before you today is a um, bill that came out of um, Chairman Atwood's subcommittee on um, juvenile justice funding. This is a bill to uh, spell out the number of juvenile um, district attorneys, associate district attorneys that will serve and uh, public defenders that will serve in the juvenile courts throughout the state as a result of the um, juvenile reform bill uh, last session. Um, this bill will spell out the numbers that go in each district. It is uniform between both the um, PDs and the um, district attorneys. The first section quickly goes through. The, the, the meat of it is on page um, section 3, page 3. Um, you'll see it lines 71 through 79. This talks about the numbers of appointments that, are, that may be uh, allocated to which is dependent upon the number of superior court judges within each of the circuits. Mm -hmm. uh, subpart two there, being in line 80, discusses the funding mechanism. Um, and this is subject to funding appropriations. You'll see that funding shall come from the appropriations made by the General Assembly um, for these positions. So it would be subject to our appropriation of money for that. Um, and then the Prosecuting Attorney's Council would then determine um, the, uh, how the allocate, how the monies would actually be allocated to each circuit. Um, it is based upon a set of rules that PAC has to establish and the criteria for the rules are set forth in lines 89 through 96. You have a mirror image of that provision almost uh, verbatim with dealing with the public defenders. Um, again, public defenders in lines 127 through lines um, 135. Uh, spell out the numbers per Superior Court Justice in each of the circuits. Lines 136 through 147 sets forth how the funding will be disseminated, and that will be set by rules of the Council. 
um, and, uh, and then determined by apportionment by the director. Both, again, are subject to funding by the General Assembly, um, and it is a funding, an equal funding or a funding of the, of the two of them at the same time by the General Assembly, not one or the other, so that the funds would be issued by the General Assembly, appropriated by the General Assembly, and then it's up to each entity to then determine what circuits will get the money um, and how much uh, based upon the rules that they're required to set up under this bill. Have any questions for the uh, presenter, sponsor? Seeing none, uh, is there anybody here to testify on the bill? Um, this is the Prosecuting Attorney's Council and Public Defender's Standards Council funding bill. I didn't see. I see, and I want to welcome uh, the district attorney from the Conestoga district, Bert Poston. Come on, come on up, Mr. Poston. It's good to have you here, sir. Thank you, Miss Nesbitt. Good to have you. All right. Chairman, I could just state briefly uh, as we attempt to transition into the new uh, uh, juvenile code that went into effect January 1st that, uh, of course, as, as anticipated, uh, it does shift additional responsibilities and create additional responsibilities for prosecutors, and I know it does the same on the public defender side, and that uh, we personally, myself, as well as the Association of the Council, uh, support this bill as a way to, to take that step forward to get state funding for those positions uh, to be able to do that job. And uh, we understand that it's subject to appropriation down the road, mm -hmm. but uh, we think it's an important step forward and to create that framework uh, to be able to get those positions and have them funded by the state. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deborah Nesbitt with the Association of County Commissioners. And first, I want to thank Representative uh, Welch for working with us to drop this bill last year. Uh, we realized as soon as the House Bill 242, the Juvenile Code Rewrite, passed uh, that we were going to need additional resources at the county level to comply with the new requirements of that uh, statute. And he was kind enough uh, to, to work with us to try to come up with some way to provide some funding at the local level uh, to meet those new requirements. Uh, so we fully support the bill and, and appreciate his hard work on this bill. Thank you very much. Um, also, I see from the Conestoga Circuit we have with us uh, Superior Court Judge uh, Boyette here. Thank you very much for being here, Judge Boyette. It's great to have you. Do we have any other members of the judiciary here? I know we have, we had Judge Teske. Okay. All right. Um, any other input on the bill? Seeing, uh, just briefly. Rusty Sewell with State Bar, I just want to say we support the legislation. It's kind of a continuation of the new juvenile code that we were highly okay. active with. Okay, could you just you. stay right there if you would. Um, I think Representative Quick has a question. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have a question for some one person most knowledgeable. Um, so, some of this we covered in subcommittee, but for the benefit of the other members who weren't there, if, if you could go through the number of new state employees that are created by this legislation, the fiscal note, and the cost of full appropriation, and then I'm still a little concerned about the relationship, if any, between this formula, this uh, formula for the creation and um, caseload. I'm going to ask that you direct that to the author of the bill. Okay. Okay. Uh, Representative Quick, thank you for the questions. i um, try to hit all of them. First, a uh, physical note done on this legislation, the original drop legislation, which in that original le legislation um, spelled out the numbers of the same numbers and structure of assigning uh, PDs and uh, district attorneys um, that, that I just outlined based upon Superior Court judges. That, that hasn't changed. It's been the same from the initial drop. And so that, that legislation to fully fund uh, all the circuits, and it would be about a $16 million um, appropriation from the General Assembly. The problem we have is that, that, that obviously that money is not available for full appropriation. So what you have to do is do it at a 
in a piecemeal fashion as appropriations become available um, to appropriate them to both the two um, sides of the V and then and then uh, do that on a piecemeal basis and that was the structure that came up that I was discussing before so that takes care of the the as far as the number of employees that was in the um, fiscal note I think it was in the folders from the first committee I don't know if it's in your folder here it's not. and I don't recall the number of um, the total number I think it was 90 it's 96 six, 96 I was almost there. 96 employees and then you had associated staff with those so that was the other additional expense that was associated with it and the problem we ran into was okay if you're going to do this on a piecemeal basis then how do you apportion and so the appropriation is going to be to just the council um, and to PAC and so that internally based upon their rules which they're required to set up those rules through this bill then they will determine internally how to allocate to the various circuits hopefully we could do it on the most needy on a, on a kind of a most needy basis so that where you have the highest caseload and I think this goes to your other part of your question representative quick is that working with uh, Deborah Nesbitt um, and folks at PAC and the council we we actually have looked at where are those circuits that are have the greatest demand um, and we're trying to address that from a perspective of caseload and then the other part of it is is you have a lot of rural circuits that are large circuits that um, you know you, you the, the the judges themselves need the assistance so uh, those are some factors that we have talked about but the problem is you can't you, it's, it's it's almost impossible to put that in in legislation so but this this uh, framework in tying it to the superior court caseload that that is the superior court formula is based on caseload mm -hmm. but there's been no such correlation made with the ju these juvenile court positions at this point as i understand it we have not made a correlation between the superior court caseload we're only mirroring the existing law with respect to the appointment of da's and pd's and juvenile, and juvenile judges, judges, yeah. judges uh, as it mirrors um, superior court so you really don't have a caseload study with respect to juvenile court judges either you're just you're just tracking the the kind of the existing standard if you will and I believe what the, the the what the point of that is is to balance the um, employment of other district attorneys and public defenders with the judges that are appointed um, and that's and I because I had the same question when I walked through the the legislation and uh, what it does is it just matches DAs and PDs with the juvenile court judges that are uh, that are uh, appointed or elected, whichever way it's set for. And, and as it is stands right now, Mr. Chairman, if I may, is, is you don't have a you know if we don't take a positive step in that direction, we're we've left we've left local governments with an unfunded mandate. Um, yeah. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to legislate that there is that the intention of the General Assembly is not to have an unfunded mandate so that locals are having to buy for it themselves. Um, is the structure is the structure that's proposed in the bill perfect? I, I really can't say that it is or is not, but I can tell you that it gives a structure whereby we now know uh, on both sides of the V how how money can come down and how it will be administered and the the numbers of uh, of attorneys that will be in juvenile court to help represent um, the state and represent um, indigent, uh, indigent defendants and, and I believe that there's been uh, sub substantial testimony regarding the uh, difficulty that uh, district attorneys and I Mr. Poston might speak to that and, and Ms. Nesbitt uh, with the district attorneys generally I think for the most part opting in and doing the prosecutions for criminal matters or in juvenile court and then uh, if they don't have that then they'll have other private entities that the county has to take on themselves uh, and you also have other issues that are related to that this bill will put it in place where we can we have a way of measuring how many people get hired and who doesn't Mr. Poston and I, I could add, I mean, we, I think, uh, speaking for most uh, district attorneys, we think it's important for the elected district attorney to stay in juvenile court. Um, 
in my circuit recently we had a uh, child who was uh, charged with attempt to create an explosive device that was uh, kind of tracking a Columbine type shooting. So there's some very serious cases that go through juvenile court and we think it's important to stay there and right now we're diverting resources uh, a few hours a week of a Superior Court prosecutor to go down and, and handle juvenile court as they have time to and it's important to have I think a full-time prosecutor uh, position there. I can also speak to how the uh, how we allocate funds when we don't get full funding because we've um, we're in the process of trying to get funding for uh, accountability court prosecutors in each circuit and funding was allocated for 12 out of 49 circuits and the way we went about allocating that the prosecuting attorneys council it's almost a grant process each each district attorney that wanted to be considered submits an application with caseload data with um, demographic data with it, whatever information, whatever criteria we set and kind of makes our case for how, uh, for the need. And then the council votes and decides to allocate those. So if we didn't get the full 16 million in the first year, no one's <coughs> expecting that, then we do have a mechanism because we have experience with that in uh, determining what the fairest allocation is based on our need. Any further questions? Seeing none, is there anybody else that would like to testify regarding the bill? Yes, ma'am. Could you let this let you have a spot? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Atia Holly, and I'm a staff attorney with the Southern Center for Human Rights here in Atlanta. Among other things, we work to protect the right to counsel for poor people accused of crime. I'm here basically just to offer our strong support for this bill. If enacted, it will make real the right to counsel for all poor children accused of uh, delinquent acts in this state, um, as required under the Georgia Constitution and Indigent Defense Act. While some public defender offices have dedicated attorneys to appear in court, a number of them do not. The court deal circuit is a prime example of that. With only three attorneys to handle cases in four superior courts and four juvenile courts, there are many days where the public defender just cannot be in juvenile court. What that means for the children in these courts is one of two things. One, they see a number of delays in their cases because there's no public defender there. Or two, they just proceed without an attorney because no one is there to represent them. HB 674 will hopefully change this sad state of affairs and ensure that all children receive what they are constitutionally and statutorily entitled to, an effective lawyer. Without it, a poor child's access to a lawyer will continue to depend on their zip code. That's all I have. If you have any further questions, just let me know. Any questions? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further comment from the public? We're going to close off public comment at this point, and the bill will be on the breast of the committee. Is there any motions? I hear a motion. Motion do pass, Mr. Chair. Motion do pass. Second. Any any further motions? Any discussion? Hearing none. Chair calls a question. All those in favor of the motion do pass. Signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Is that Apparently it, it passed unanimously. <laughs> okay. The next bill we'll call is, um, sir, sure. Yes, sir. House Bill 251, Representative Powell, Chairman Powell, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to have you here, Mr. Paul. Well, it's good to be here. I don't think I've ever been to this committee, especially this long. <laughs> bring to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you uh, House Bill 251. It's LC 287064ERS as a substitute. Could you say that LC number again, please, sir? 7064 ERS. That's 287064 ERS? Yes, sir. Okay. Could you explain the bill, please, sir? Be glad to. Ladies and gentlemen, the committee introduced this bill last year uh, at the behest of a lot of the stakeholders in the retailers, uh, manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors of tobacco products. 
this new day and time, uh, there's a lot of other things other than cigarettes and cigars that are out there for uh, for for the for the uh, use or the abuse, whichever one you want to consider for the public. Uh, alternative, if you'll look on uh, starting on line 13 uh, through 58, these are new definitions. Uh, definitions of alternative nicotine products. Um, the most important one would be um, starting on line 49. This is the vapor products. You may be familiar with uh, these vapor cigarettes and things like that. They're alternative cigarettes. They have nicotine in them. Got a little heating thing, and you know, people. I guess I always thought it was just <coughs> something to occupy your hands where you're trying to break the habit. But apparently, it must be pretty popular to a lot of folks. But anyway, that's the definitions, and what, from Section 2 through the rest of the bill, we're restating current law to add in these new alternative tobacco products so that they'll be treated the same way as the old traditional tobacco, uh, like cigarettes and things like that, including the signage uh, at the retail stores. It would add not just tobacco and tobacco products and cigarettes, but alternative nicotine products or vapor products would then be added to the signage in these uh, in these uh, in the retail locations, don't know anybody is opposed to it. Uh, you know the industry, as I said, the industry has been supportive of this. It took a year uh, this with a low number, uh, as you see the bill number. The bill was dropped in last year. Uh, there's been a lot of work by the stakeholders uh, to produce this bill. And I would ask for your consideration, favorable consideration. Is there any further comments on the bill? Anybody else here to comment on the bill? I think we have Miss uh, Ellen Reynolds. Oh, no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really just a comment. Um, we absolutely applaud the intention to restrict access to minors. Um, and honestly, we only got this language yesterday, so our legal. Could you just state who, who you Sorry, represent? Sorry, the American Heart Association. Okay. Um, and um, so we have sent this up for their review. Our only concern um, is to ensure where you see a definition of alternative nicotine product it's stating that it's not a tobacco product but actually there's and I and I this is a question for the committee it's just a comment for consideration by greater minds than mine again like we, we I said we just got this language yesterday um, but there is a US Court of Appeals decision on point that says nicotine is a tobacco product under the Tobacco Control Act we just want to make sure that we're not creating a new definition of an alternative nicotine product that would at some point exempt liquid nicotine as a tobacco product. And it's my understanding from the author that is absolutely not his intention. Um, so that's the only question we would have. Um, I can tell you I emailed the FDA. They are in the process of creating a rule, and it's at OMB waiting on that to come down. Um, and uh, with, I emailed them last night with uncharacteristic lightning speed from the federal government. They did email me back this morning. Um, and just express that they are on the verge of issuing a rule. So I have a copy of that email if anybody would like to see it. Would, yeah, could we see that? So again, not opposition. We may be back at a later date if our legal counsel at the National Department shows that there are concerns that this in some way would create a separate definition for nicotine as not a tobacco product. Um, that is the reason the FDA is, is coming about is because originally they were trying to block e-cigarettes as a drug and unless they're going to be used as a cessation drug, the FDA does not have authority to regulate them um, except as a tobacco product under the Tobacco Control Act per the DC Circuit Court of Appeals decision. Okay. So that's all. Any questions for this presenter? Uh, we do. We have is that Ernest? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go right ahead, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming up and uh, Representative Powell for presenting this bill. I just have one question, uh, just to be uh, absolutely specific. Uh, this basically is only for minors. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. And we certainly support restricting youth access. And we appreciate the authors. I uh, had to intentions. ask that because uh, my phone has literally been blowing up uh, because there are many adults that have these uh, these vapor cigarettes. And 
It was a bit of a panic, so I wanted to get that point. No, and I, I don't know of anyone s suggesting they shouldn't be sold okay. to adults, even as uh, you know, nicotine products. It's it's simply we definitely don't want minors having access. And the only concern that we have, and again, I haven't gotten word back from the Heart Association, is just to say, for the record, there if if it turns out that there's a reading of this legislation where wherein it can be read that alternative nicotine product is not is to is, is considered to be exempted from tobacco, mm -hmm. that's where we would be back with concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further comment from the public? All right, seeing none, we'll close off public comment at this time, uh, and the bill will be on the breast of the committee. Is there a motion? So moved. Got to move, do pass in a second. Uh, any any discussion by the members? Seeing none, the chair will call the question. All those in favor of the motion do pass. Signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Bill passes unanimous. Yes, sir. Okay. Chair calls House Bill 524. Representative Buzz Brockway. Hey, Mr. Chairman, and uh Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I appreciate it. I bring back to you for your consideration again, House Bill 524. Uh, there's been a number of changes made to this bill since since we last met, but I, I look around and I see that a lot, a, lot, a, excuse me, a lot of folks were on the Welch subcommittee that dealt with this and took a number of hours of testimony. So basically what I'll, I'll do as quickly as I can is explain how the bill exists right now and then answer any questions that you may have as best I can. Uh, the, the way what this bill deals with, just to refresh your memory, is uh, trying to provide access to adult adoptees to obtain a copy of their original birth certificate. And that original birth certificate is one that would have been canceled by adoption. And this would give these folks, uh, uh, attempt to give these folks access to that document when they become adults if they see fit. Currently, right now, they have to go to court uh, to do that. So the way the bill sits right now, if an adult adoptee wants a copy of their original birth certificate, they would write, uh, they would contact the Department of Public Health. And if, uh, we, if a contact preference form is on file from one of the birth parents, and, it, and scenario one would be that uh, contact preference form says it is okay, the birth parent says I'm, it's okay uh, to provide this information, then an unredacted copy of the adoptee's original birth certificate would be provided to them. If no, for, if no contact preference form is present, then the Department of Public Health would attempt to contact the birth parent and get their opinion and, and get them to fill out uh, a contact preference form. And of course, if, if, the adult adopt, if the birth parent says it's okay to be contacted, then the adult adoptee is provided an unredacted copy of that birth certificate. If the uh, birth parent says, I do not wish to be contacted, uh, then a copy of the original birth certificate with the birth parent's information is redacted, and that uh, redacted form is provided to them. Uh, if they cannot get in touch with the uh, birth parent, uh, then the original birth certificate is provided to the adopt adoptee with information redacted. So. Uh, it's a little more complicated than when we first arrived, but I think that, uh, uh, that that's how the bill rests right now. And I'll be happy to answer any questions I have as best as I can. Okay. Do you have some questions? Uh, Representative Oliver? I'm a co-sponsor of this bill and have long supported it. Yeah. Um, I'm reluctant, even though we had a, a really excellent set, I mean, uh, uh, subcommittee Chairman Welch did a really good job at a lot of time on this, a lot of very, very thoughtful testimony. And there's a fair-minded debate and a close vote. Well, I don't remember how close the vote was, but it was a vote. Um, 
I'm reluctant to support this in this draft. And let me ask you this. Uh, this duplicates the uh, adoption reunion registry in some format. It creates a new bureaucracy around a different agent, a slightly different agency. I mean, the vital records are in public health. We'll have an adoption reunion registry format, and the adoption reunion registry is in DHS also. So yes. we'll have duplicating state roles. Right. And it basically says that you're not entitled to your original birth certificate if uh, a birth parent objects. Is that correct? That's correct. So we are not achieving the goal of, if you believe in the principle that an adoptee is entitled to his or her birth certificate, we're not achieving that goal and we're creating a new state bureaucracy. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with you and I, I struggled and I, I met with Chairman uh, Weldon about this and I, I struggled with what to do and mm -hmm. how to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking the committee to to move the bill forward for really for one simple reason. I, um, mo but basically, basically give me more time to learn more about this issue. I've, you know, all of this area of law was new to me a couple of years ago when I mm -hmm. when this this group came to me and I've learned a lot about the original birth certificate issue. Mm -hmm. But yes, putting putting this together with the with the uh, reunion registry is a whole area of law that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm attempting to learn as much as I can. And so I uh, I, I will tell you that the Georgians for uh, Gear, the group that that was supporting this bill, they don't want this bill to move forward. Right. Uh, I, I'm coming asking the committee to move it forward to give me more time to learn more about this issue. Uh, and the reason that uh, the reason that I'm doing that is I, I can see a scenario, you know, we, to use a football analogy, not every play has to score a touchdown. Uh, sometimes we, we can move the ball forward and, we, and maybe that we are providing more people with access to their original birth certificate than we currently are now. Mm -hmm. And I, I, as I read the bill, I think we do that which is why I'm asking the committee to move this forward. I, I'm willing to, you know, as I said, uh, the whole reunion registry aspect of this is not one that I understand deeply. The group gear says that we're, they don't like that aspect of it, and that's mm -hmm. which is why they, they want the bill pulled. So um, I'm willing to admit that, uh, that, that, that I don't know a lot about that law, and they might mm -hmm. be right, uh, in which case then, you know, we'll set the bill aside and not, and not move it forward in, in rules committee, but you know I've, I've read it and thought it and uh, thought about it and talked about it, and I th I think that this bill provides more people access to original unredacted copy of the birth certificate than presently have it now. Mr. Chairman, may I follow up? Sir, I've said publicly and said in pr people individually, the hardest thing down here is when to walk away from a compromise. Right. Um, and. Because I'm supportive of you in passing this bill, I'll, I'm not going to create any barrier today. But I'm not promising you I'll vote for it if it comes to the floor. I understand. And I, and I appreciate you know, over these last three years as as I've been working with this, and I know you had carried a bill similar to this in the past. Uh, your counsel and advice on this means a lot, and I appreciate it. The adoption registry, the adoption reunion registry, has worked very well. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's about 20 years old, and DHS, in different formats, basically hired a private detective for that the, that the person requesting the reunion paid for at a at a at a good fi a fair fee, um, and there was successful reunions accomplished through it very well. It was passed because there were people taking advantage of adoptees and charging lots and lots of money. I'll go find your birth parents if you give me fifteen thousand dollars. So um, it's it's been a successful effort, and I don't want to take away from it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Smith. Thank you, uh, Representative Brockway. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you know, we're policy wonks, and typically we we use these terms and these phrases all the time. 
But for the sake of clarity for uh, most of the folk uh, on the public side, uh, I'd like just a point of clarification so that they'll understand what some of these words mean. Yes, sir. Uh, on line 92, the uh, sentence, an uncertified copy of the adopted person's birth certificate which has been redacted. Can you share with them what redacted is? Sure. Well, was that referring to, first of all, uncertified copy just clarifies that the, when someone is adopted, okay, they're, they're, whenever, when someone's born, you get a birth certificate, right? And if that person is adopted, then their birth certificate is canceled and a new one is issued with the adopted parents' names on it as the parents, okay? Now, if, if an adoptee obtains a copy of their original birth certificate, that is just a copy of the birth certificate. It carries no legal status whatsoever. So that's why it says uncertified copy. It's just a document with information on it, okay? Uh, now, redaction here would refer to the, uh, again, talking about the original birth certificate. If a birth parent says, I do not wish to be contacted, then that birth parent's name that's on that original birth certificate will be redacted. Does that answer your question, sir? Sure. Good to very good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. We do Rep get technical sometimes. <laughs> Representative Bell. Friendly question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so through this process, I've slept very few nights thinking about this bill. So are you telling me now I'm going to have to vote and still be kept up at night about this particular <laughs> bill? Well, uh, Representative, let me just put it this way. My four years down here, I've learned that no issue is ever finished <laughs> in the legislature. So, yes. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Even when a bill's defeated, it's still alive. <laughs> this might be renamed the, the No Sleep for Representative Bell for Simone. Uh, is there any, anybody else to comment on the bill? Seeing none, the uh, bills in the breast of the committee. Um, I have a motion. Motion do pass and second. All those in favor of motion do pass. Well, excuse me, excuse me. Is there any discussion of the bill? All those in favor of the motion do pass. Signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Abstain. Bill passes. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. Let me let me clarify that the bill House Bill 826 passes by committee substitute. 524. Excuse me. Yes, 524. <laughs> House Bill 524 passes by committee substitute LC 29-5897. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we'll take a five minute break and be back in at four o'clock. Thank you.
Travis. Um, she is the reason you have uh, LC 295546S in front of you. Um, and the reason it feels warm in your hand is because she worked uh, between committee meetings and, and read my terrible notes all afternoon trying to get this together for you. So thank you very much for all your efforts. Um, I'm going to go through the bill uh, each section and, and talk about um, talk about it as we go and try to highlight areas that have changed in the in the uh, in the draft that's in front of you from prior drafts. Let me start with the section one. The name of the bill uh, is the Journey and Coward Act, and um, so you know, uh, Journey and Coward was a one-year-old child who was killed in Bartow County about three weeks ago, just before we introduced the bill. And I thought it was fitting to, to uh, apply her name to this bill um, to remind us why we're doing this particular kind of work. Um, Journey Ann Cowart uh, um, was one year old when she was killed uh, under circumstances that ultimately led to her mother's arrest and her mother's boyfriend, who have both now been charged in a murder. So this is a very important piece of work that, that we hope will have significant real world results. Let me talk about the substance of the bill. Section two really is uh, a pretty simple part to deal with. Currently, the um, uh, currently the child fatality review panel exists under the uh, office of the Georgia Child Advocate, and this bill, right up front, is going to remove uh, the panel from the uh, from the child advocate's office. You'll see later in the bill that we actually are just moving the panel uh, from the Child Advocates Office over to GBI. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get to that portion of the bill. Um, we also uh, have some cleanup language. Uh, you'll notice that in the existing law, there's a reference to the review subcommittee uh, throughout the bill, but it actually should properly be called the review committee. Each county has its own review committee uh, and we'll talk about the duties of those review committees later, but just to be clear, th th those committees are, are, are set up to do their own work. They're not really a subcommittee of any other committee, so that's the review committee we'll be addressing a little bit later. Section 3, strikes, and uh, looking at line 59, uh, strikes the definition of eligible deaths. And uh, the reason for that is because the term eligible deaths is not used anywhere in the article. Um, the direction to the review committee as to what deaths should be investigated is expressed within the code, um, and, uh, and that, that section we'll also be reviewing a little bit later. Uh, but the, um, the definition here is, is meaningless, so it needs to be removed. Um, the rest of this uh, section 3, uh, 7, 8, and 10 subsections that you see there beginning on line 64 and continuing through 74, uh, are removing uh, sort of definitional language from uh, descriptions of the panel, the protocol committee, and the review committees, which are the three entities we really deal with in this, in this bill. And they'll be re-identified later in uh, other sections of the bill, but we're removing them from, uh, uh, from uh, Chapter 15 of Title IX, 19-15-1 uh, in Section 3. Section 4. Uh, beginning at line 79, uh, 79 and 80, adds language to clarify really what the work of the review committee can be uh, can be used for, and we're adding language to say that it can be used for the investigation and prosecution of alleged, uh, of alleged child abuse cases. Um, so, uh, just just so that it's clear that um, that the protocols are set up. Uh, for a broader purpose than may have been identified in, in the code previously. Um, the protocol committee uh, uh, duty is um, spelled out a little more clearly. I'm, I'm sorry. The, the protocol committee duty uh, inserted at line 86 and 87 is actually from um, section 3. I told you we would cut it out of section 3 and reinsert it, uh, and that is the uh, the language from line 68 through 70 is reinserted there at 86 through uh, 87. Now, um, starting at line 88 and going down through 102, uh, these are the first changes that you'll notice from the original version of the bill. 
And the changes that were made here from the original version are simply uh, cleanup, sort of stylistic changes uh, that make the bill a little more uh, easy to read. Because, you know, you want all bills to be easy to read. Um, if you don't laugh at my jokes, I'll quit trying to tell them. All right. Um, section, uh, section H of, uh, go down to line 138, and you'll see Section H there. Um, that is, clarifies the requirement for the committee to make an annual report. Moving on down to Section J at 160, uh, line 160. Uh, clarifies that the um, members of the committee are to have, have a, uh, training within the first year of their appointment to the committee. Um, and then looking at line 173, beginning there and uh, to the end, you'll see the word, uh, there's a change, there are several references already in the code to sexual abuse and exploitation protocol. And we're, we're changing the language to say sexual abuse and sexual exploitation protocol, primarily uh, to, to clarify the understanding of the state and the policy of the state that sexual abuse and sexual ex exploitation are two different terms, two different concepts, and they need to be treated uh, as separate uh, concepts by the panels or by the committee. And um, at line 180, you find the second change from the original draft. Uh, and line 180, line 180 uh, clarifies that the protocols adopted by the pro com protocol committee uh, will not create any new rights under the law. So the protocol committee, when it establishes protocol for the investigation and prosecution of child abuse cases in general, uh, will not be um, establishing any uh, any new rights uh, for any person who may be investigated. Uh, they can't later complain that the protocol uh, was not followed and therefore their rights were violated. They can't raise that as a defense in, in a criminal prosecution, and they can't use it as a basis for bringing a, a private civil action uh, against the committee or the county. Um, so that's the second, second change we have from the original bill. Moving on to Section 5. Section 5 really cleans up and focuses languages, uh, language related to uh, the activities of the local review committee. Now, the local review committee is the body that, and I didn't, I didn't quite define uh, these terms yet, but let me do that quickly. Um, the panel you'll sometimes hear referred to as the Georgia Child Fatality Review Panel. That exists at the state level. There's one panel. The members of that panel are set out in, uh, in, um, in the further sections of, the, of this bill. But the, uh, the panel is sort of the overseer of, of the functions of the protocol committee and the uh, review committee. The protocol committees and the review committees exist in each county. The protocol committee is set up to do exactly what it sounds like, which is to establish protocols for um, investigating child abuse uh, cases as they arise in the county. The um, review committee by contrast, is set up to review actual incidents of child abuse uh, that involve a fatality or near fatality and essentially uh, make an accounting of what happened, what went wrong uh, in the system, if you will, and to decide or to talk about how that can be fixed on the local level. So that's really what the purpose um, of those three entities are. So moving right along, Section 5. Um, cleans up and focuses language related to the activities of the local review committee. And again, you'll see it lines 190 through 192. That's the, that's the language we struck in section 2, and it's restated here. And um, at line 201, you'll find the, uh, the next change that is uh, different from the original draft, and that is um, simply re-identifying, re if you will, the uh, county public health department representative as a member of the of this uh, review committee, and the reason is the, the just the the term of art, the language that's in use now has changed since this bill was originally drafted, or since the the law was originally passed. Um, moving on down to um, if you look at beginning on uh, line 205, um, there is the uh, I'm sorry at, at uh, at 210, excuse me, line 210, 
these are the these are the uh, instances in which the review committee is called upon to do its its review, and that, those are cases of uh, the deaths of children uh, from the age of birth through age 17, and then um, subparagraphs one through nine give the various um, circumstances around which uh, a death of a child should cause a committee review to begin. And we're adding uh, at line 223, uh, number nine, the term child abuse, which is defined under the juvenile code. And um, I think previously that, that term had not really been sufficiently defined to be included here. And uh, this is one of the changes suggested uh, by the Barton Group and, uh, and others. Um, then move down to line 226. Uh, this is really uh, a, a gap-filling provision, if you will. Um, when a child dies, it's the duty of the medical examiner or the coroner to notify the review committee of the death, and, uh, and that's really how they start their, their work. Um, if a child dies outside of his or her home county, then the medical examiner coroner in that county is required already under law to notify the coroner in the home county of the child. But we didn't have a provision that required that coroner to then notify his local review committee to start work. So this uh, language at 226 to 229 uh, fills in that gap, requiring the local coroner to notify the local review committee of the child's death. Um, moving on to, um, on down to lines 286. Um, 286 through 288 is another change from the previous version of the bill. The review committee uh, may request a subpoena uh, to be issued from a superior court judge. And there's been some, some confusion in the past about exactly how that process works. The information I received from the prosecuting attorney's counsel is practically no one uh, that they're aware of uses the subpoena opportunity because they're not really sure what the process should be. So we're just adding in a little language to tell them that the process is the same as you would use uh, for subpoenas and so in, in any other case uh, uh, in the, in the um, evidence code, Chapter 13, Title 24. Then uh, line 291 through 298, uh, this, is, um, this is designed to ensure there's no uh, HIPAA objection raised to the disclosure of uh, personally identifiable uh, information or protected health information that would be uh, barred under the federal HIPAA statute. Uh, this clarifies that this can be considered or should be considered a law enforcement uh, function such that uh, HIPAA would, and the HIPAA exemption, excuse me, the HIPAA exception uh, for law enforcement activities would apply and that information can be provided. All right, moving on down to section six. Um, line 318 uh, restates the purpose of the panel. Uh, and lines um, 321, beginning of line 321, we uh, are assigning to the director of the GBI uh, the authority to coordinate the work of the panel. And uh, line 325, we're assigning that to the Division of Forensic Sciences of the GBI for administrative purposes. Um, beginning with line 329, this is uh, the, the membership of the state panel. These are the members of the panel, how it's composed. Uh, if, and, and in all of the, all of the back and forth that, that uh, Ms. Travis and I had today, there was only one area where we just didn't get it exactly right, and that's in this section. So we're going to have, I'm going to ask you to, um, to make an amendment before we're done today. Um, but if you look at line 338, it strikes chairperson of the Board of Human Services. We actually want to keep that person uh, on, the, on this panel. So we're going, to, we're going to ask that you not strike that language. We are going to add or we'd like to add the Commissioner of Early Care and Learning. So that language is on line five. We'll just need to come in later in the bill. And also down on line 353, a member of the State Board of Education 
we want to add the words appointed by the governor. Um, some of these other positions are commissioners or, or positions that only there's only one person in the state who fits that description. With the state board, you have several members, so we need to clarify that that'll be an appointment by the governor uh, of a member of the state board. All right, uh, moving on down to the next uh, part, uh, starting at line 354. This just clarifies the uh, responsibility of the GBI to report to members of the legislature. Um, in the annual report by the panel. Um, down in section seven, uh, and as we're getting into this, these last few sections, let me say this. Uh, what we really wanted to do was make sure that we had an open flow of information to the review committees. Um, we don't want them to have impediments to getting access to the records they need to do their work or to the people they need to do their work. And so part of what we're doing is we're trying to clarify in line 374 that uh, members of the protocol or review committees or the panel are not going to be liable for any civil or criminal prosecution uh, for the authorized disclosure and use of the information that they obtain as they're doing their work on the committee. Moving on to section eight. Again, this is um, really the administrative piece of this um, at 390 to 390, uh, 390 to 400 really is about um, uh, the duty of the um, the duty of the GBI uh, as the administrative uh, overseer of the panel, and um, adding to that the duty to coordinate the free flow of the information to the local review committees between the panel and the local committees. And this will assist the review committees in doing their work, uh, hopefully with, with, again, fewer impediments as they go along. Section 9 simply restates, or I should say Section 9 states the policy of the General Assembly to provide for uh, transparency in uh, investigations involving child abuse and child fatalities uh, in order to protect the children of the state. And that policy is reflected in the changes we see in Section 10. Section 10 is intended to simplify uh, what are somewhat convoluted provisions regarding, um, uh, regarding public access to information um, about child abuse investigations and child abuse uh, incidents. And beginning at line 416, what's marked as uh, paragraph 6, um, what we've done is we've, str we've struck through uh, a lot of language that, that really wasn't easy to read, wasn't very clear, but we've tried to concisely restate the same information by um, making the list that starts at line 427. So we're not trying to expand or constrict uh, the access to the information. We just want to make it clear <laughs> Uh, what information should be uh, redacted from uh, records of investigations that have been requested by the public. Now, Section 6 that we're reading, this part is intended to apply to the panel, the review committee, and the, the, um, the protocol committee. This is not intended to apply to uh, DFACS or the Sheriff's Office or other um, individual agencies. So. If you look at lines 427 through 437, you'll see the kind of information that the panel or the committee could redact in responding to a request for information. Uh, in information that would jeopardize a criminal investigation, medical and mental health records, privileged communication of attorney, identifying inf information of a person who reported the abuse, information that may cause harm to a, a, a sibling or another child in the household, uh, looking at Section F. Now, F, G, and H are additions to what the original bill had. Section F, the name of the child who suffered the near, a near fatality, so in other words, a child who has not died, uh, but protecting their information. Um, G and H have to do with uh, the identity of innocent parties related to the child uh, involved in the investigation. And again, if you look at through the, the language that struck really at um, 424 and 425, you'll see that there was an intention to preserve the confidentiality of the child, other children in the household, parents, guardians, custodians, caretakers. So that's all 
a simply a restatement of what's already in the code, hopefully in a little more uh, clear fashion. And then moving on, um, getting down to really the last part of this of this bill, starting line 469 through the end. Um, in particular, 475 through 477 tell us, and again, this is this section has to do with um, redacting information from Open Records Act requests, but it's more uh, narrowly tailored, and it only applies to um, uh, a child who, at the time of his or her fatality or near fatal incident, was either uh, of these uh, categories at 475 through 478: a child in the custody of a state department agency or a foster parent, uh, a child in need of services, um, or a child who's a subject of an investigation, report, referral, or complaint under um, under under uh, the um, under, under Title 15. And the um, information that can be redacted from those reports, if you look down at lines 485 through 489. It's different than what you saw above, and the reason is because we don't want to expand um, the uh, the exceptions to Open Records Act for these other agencies, because we want them to be subject to public scrutiny. Uh, we want there to be transparency in what they do, and we want to allow for uh, members of the public to be able to review um, fully uh, the activities of those agencies. So there is no uh, there is no exception under this one for. Uh, information that would jeopardize a criminal investigation proceeding, as you see above, and that did not exist in the bill prior. I mean, it didn't exist in the law prior to this bill. Uh, we've also removed um, the uh, exemption for information that may cause mental or physical harm to the sibling or other child because that, that term could be uh, used and viewed as a very broad term that would allow agencies to withhold information in a way that we don't intend for them to withhold information as a General Assembly. So that is a lot of talking, and I am done. I'm open for questions. Any questions for Representative Kroomer? Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Kroomer, I think you mentioned a modification you yes, wanted to sir. make. Yes, sir. That would be, um, and, and Ms. Travis has this information. We discussed it before okay. I came down. Well, but I, I, I think we have it there. And okay. what you're talking about is on line 338. Yes, sir. Through uh, 353. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Which one? Which one? Okay. And Ms. Ms. Uh, Travis, would you give us the uh, modification? Sure. Line 338. Yeah, on line, on line 338, you're going to take out the striking of chairperson of Board of Human Resources. At line 353, after education, add the clause appointed by the governor, semicolon, and add a new line after line 353 to say, parens 18, the commissioner of early care and learning, period. Okay. That's the, that's the amendment you want to yes, make sir, that, there? That's correct. Okay. Is that here a motion on the amendment? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of the motion for the amendment uh, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. Passes. Okay, we'll make that amendment and we'll put that in a. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's right. Um, okay, now we have a few questions for you. Okay. That's what. Okay. Okay. Ms. Oliver, Representative Oliver. Mr. Chairman, I didn't know if anybody had signed up to speak on the bill. Is anyone here to speak on the bill? I don't see anybody. Anyone to speak on the bill? Seeing none. I just have one question, Mr. Chairman. On, on, thank you very much for your work on this. I know it's a lot. Thank you. Sincerely. On line 427, I don't think I've seen this... Um, Phrasing information that would jeopardize a criminal investigation or proceeding before. I'm trying to figure out if that means a criminal investigation report or documents relative to a criminal investigation report that might be in a fatality review or 
something else where it has not historically been protected under the criminal investigation file? Well, it's, it's, not the, it's not my intention to create a new category of protection. And to that point, if you look at 419, you'll see that this is the information that was already in, in the existing code. Mm -hmm. Unless such disclosure of information would jeopardize a criminal investigation or proceeding. Um, so, so really, in the effort to restate the current law, mm -hmm. I, I have uh, used that language um, almost for, well, maybe, maybe exactly, almost verbatim, not exactly verbatim. Uh, that that was that. the language that we, the, re, the 2009 language that we intended to, in part, intended to redact in 2000, I mean, to repeal in 2014. So that was... Um, a little bit, but I'm happy to continue to look at that, make sure we're consistent in our goal to repeal the 2009 okay. redaction I language. Thank you. Any other question or comment on the bill? Okay. I hear a motion. As amended. Okay. Do I have a second? Then move and second. Any further discussion on the bill? Hearing none, Chair calls a question on the uh, bill. Uh, all those in favor of motion to do pass this bill uh, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. Passing unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Chair calls uh, Representative Setzler. Uh, let's see, we have this is HB 826 um, LC 29-5805. I believe that's a substitute. Is that right? It's not a substitute. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, LC 29-5943S. Okay. It's the uh, it, it's the Substitute that includes all the amendments made by the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman. Okay. There we go. Okay. Gotcha. I'm going to ask uh, Representative Coomer to um, sit in as chairman of this uh, for me. I've got another meeting to go to, and I, I appreciate you being here and uh, appreciate the committee. Thank you. All right. Uh, Chairman Sessler, go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I bring today before you HB 826. Um, again, we are working off a committee substitute LC 295943S that represents the uh, amendments made by the subcommittee. Um, simply, this bill addresses a real problem we're seeing across the state of Georgia. I'll start with a quick story, Mr. Chairman, and then kind of relate how that works relates directly to the bill itself, and then we can, at the pleasure of yourself, the committee, walk through the respective sections. Um, across the state of Georgia, um, back in the 80s and 90s, there was an effort, certainly, in, in, in making our campuses safe to draw very stringent policies, as, as, as well we should, uh, with regard to weapons on campus. Uh, the effect of that, however, sometimes takes years to play out, and what we've seen, in, in, in effect, in the last number of years, and in particular this year, uh, a number of students who've had items that the public wouldn't typically consider um, by the pure possession in an automobile or, or, or in certain other contexts, uh, criminal activity it's, it's led to criminal prosecution. The current state of the law states that if anyone is in possession 
uh, for example, of a knife with a blade longer than two inches within a school zone, uh, one commits a felony. Um, specific cases in Cobb County, um, we've seen, I'll, I'll share one or two with you, there, there are cases around the state, making bib and, and other places. But there's a student from uh, Lasker High School this year that uh, uh, when the Cobb County police were doing a standard scan of the parking lot, they took drug dogs to the parking lot, a dog alerted on a student's car. Uh, they brought the student out and they said, did you have anything in your car that's contraband the dog might have alerted on? And he said, well, uh, could have been the fireworks I had in the back of my car over the, over the 4th of July holiday. Um, they opened the car, they did find some fireworks residue, some wrappers and things. They found two firecrackers, which weren't really the issue. But unfortunately what happened is the young man who's an avid fisherman had two fishing poles and a tackle box in the back of his car. Well, in doing the, the search of the car, which they have to do when the dog alerts on a car, they opened the tackle box up and found three fishing knives that one uses to clean a fish with. Those blades were longer than two inches, and that young man uh, had to report, they, they gave him the option to report himself rather than arresting him on the spot. But he was um, um, going to otherwise be charged with a felony. He was um, our prosecutor in Cobb County, um, our, our district attorney, Vic Reynolds, um, using judgment, chose to null pross the case. Um, but the young man, by possession of a, of a knife with a blade longer than two inches in a school safety zone, in fact, committed a felony under Georgia law. Um, in a high school in my district, Alatoona High School, there was a young man who um, had a utility knife that's used to cut a seat belt by, by emergency medical technicians. He had actually been involved in rescuing people out of a burning or, or car they were afraid was going to catch on fire a year earlier and pledged, hey, you know, I, it was hard to get those folks out of those seat belts. I'm going to carry a safety knife in my car. It was a sort of a V-shaped device used to cut belts. The presence of that got him arrested and taken to Cobb County um, Jail and booked in August of this year. It's that issue that raised the question of our, our zero tolerance policy with respect to certain objects on, on, on school campuses. What this bill does is it seeks to not address firearms, um, but it does address knives, razors, clubs, bats. Under existing law, a baseball bat that's not used in conjunction with a sports program is the basis of a felony charge. Now, do I think prosecutors are going to prosecute that? I don't know of any that are, are, are looking to do that. But the way the law is drawn today, non-gunpowder related, non-firearms <coughs> non um, related items um, are, are catching young people up in these circumstances all the time. Now, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, how many members on this panel have concealed carry permits. But if you've got a Swiss Army knife with a three-inch blade and you've gone to a school function on a school safety zone with that, that Swiss Army knife in your glove box, you're guilty of a felony. Um, under Georgia law, or you've committed a felony under Georgia law. This bill seeks to take knives and similar objects, put them in the hands of school boards to regulate, um, and ensures that it's very clear that firearms are still unallowed and still felonies to carry on a school safety zone, but knives and similar objects are then handed to school boards to regulate themselves. It's certainly my expectation that school boards will prohibit knives on campus, and that's going to be within their, their responsibility. But by giving school boards the responsibility and not making it a per se violation of law just to have them on campus in a car or otherwise um, eliminates the circumstance which exists today. Administrators see good kids with these kind of objects, whether it's, oh my gosh, I was on a camping trip this weekend. I had a knife. I found it in my, in my, my book bag. I know I'm not supposed to have it. They take it by the office. There was a young man uh, within the last five years that happened to Lasseter High School as well, brought it into the administrator and said, I know I'm not supposed to have this. I found it in my book bag. But the presence of having it um, on campus was prosecutable and he was arrested and taken to jail. Now, we want our administrators to be able to apply common sense in those circumstances. But we, the legislature, have bound the hands of administrators. Administrators don't have the ability, without breaking the law themselves, to overlook those kinds of cases when common sense should apply that uh, knives aren't being used um, in a way that's, that's involved in a, in a crime. A couple things I'll say. Um, what this bill doesn't do is it doesn't tie um, anyone's hands from prosecuting um, uses of weapons and things that are crimes all the time. If a student, for example, brandishes a knife in a fight in a threatening way, that's an aggravated assault under existing Georgia law. That's, that's a felony and continues to be a felony even um, under HB 826. It's not, not addressed at all. 
But the circumstances in which kids have knives or sharp objects or, or, or shaved down sticks or, or shaved down shanks, um, the, the present, again, the, the use of those and circumstances that we recognize ought to be criminalized or criminalized today under other parts of the code. There's no need to have this zero tolerance policy to do that. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'd love to take some questions, some general ones, if that pleases the committee, before we walk through the bill. But again, the intention is not to address the firearms, not to address explosives and dangerous weapons or machine guns, but only those objects that are knives and related items, putting those hands in the hands of school boards. Lastly, I will also say, um, because kids sign codes of conduct, um, kids who have signed a code of conduct, they understand they're not allowed to carry these things on campus. Um, if they then carry them on campus, the school board still has the ability, still has the remedy of criminal trespass. Um, you know, just like someone that carries a knife on your property against, against, without their permission, can, you can call the cops on them and have them prosecuted. The same thing can still be um, pursued by school boards. But the mere presence of it in their car or, or otherwise, just the mere possession, is not a per se violation of law. It gives school boards the discretion to decide for themselves whether they press charges or whether they, they, they pursue administrative um, remedies such as suspension or expulsion. All right, thank you. You have a few questions. Uh, chair recognizes Representative Braddock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually don't have a question. I, I wanted to make a comment. Um, I sat on a school board for eight years in Paulding County, and I applaud you for bringing this forward because we would have students who, you know, might drive their parents' car to school, and their dad had hunting apparatus in the car, and they didn't know it, and you know, it was found. And again, they're they're being charged with felonies and. Um, there was nothing that we could do, you know, because, you know, the law did tie our hands on that. So I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this forward. I just wanted to say that. I can tell you, Representative Braddock, if a student unfortunately drives a car to school that's got dad's gun under the seat, this isn't going to fix that. That's still going to be. Well, or knives or, you know, whatever hunting equipment they happen to have. But it would affect a hunting knife or those kinds of things. Yeah, well, so we had several incidences where, you know, these kids should not have been prosecuted and, you know, they, they had to be. So. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm still thinking. So I appreciate this legislation. Um, I think it's very important that we do it. And I'm curious to know if at all during your process of writing this particular bill, if you considered and if this has anything to do with this, that the federal government is making recommendations pretty much along these same lines is that we use more discretion before we kick kids out of school so that we don't have kids in the school to prison pipeline. Um, and so if I, I feel like this bill is kind of in line with that, and is that kind of what you're looking at doing, is that we're not prosecuting or, we, or just leaving it to, we're leaving it to the Board of Education to be able to determine what really happens as opposed to just the zero tolerance? Right. What, what this does is it seeks to, to recognize that even though knives and the like items can be used for dangerous, for, for for bad purposes, it draws a line between knives and firearms. That firearms still are going to be, if you have a firearm on campus as a student, um, you're still committing a felony. It, it doesn't address the firearm piece. But it, it recognizes that for lots of practical reasons, people have utility knives and things like that in their cars, or there could be in a book bag inadvertently. It, it's, it says those things are, 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 are very different with respect to what's always a crime and is out of the hands of the school board. It puts knives in the hands of the school board to make those determinations. It doesn't just make it an automatic follow May I ask a follow-up, please? Sure. And so the school board, when, when they have discretion, do they currently have something that they follow? Or I don't see in this particular bill where we give them a criteria to follow. Is that something that the school boards themselves will determine on a local basis? Yes, ma'am. I can, I can point to where um, it's, it's in the bill and okay. um, where school boards are clearly empowered to do it. Okay. Um, I will tell you to the, to the point of your, your, your question about federal law, lines 236 through 241 was actually added back in at the request of the School Boards Association. Okay. Because federal law does require us 
to have a standard that a firearm, right. or in this case what we call a dangerous weapon, which is a bazooka, hand grenade, that kind of thing, if those things are possessed on a school campus, there's a requirement to suspend the student. Absolutely. Expel them for a year. And that's the case. It, that federal law also says that, that however, um, a panel, a hearing officer um, can does have the authority to modify that expulsion. So just as they say there's an expulsion, there's also the ability to use discretion there. Okay. That does mirror federal law in, in that area. Okay. Um, but right above that, lines 233 through 235, it again mirrors existing law that, uh, that mandates that school boards will have a policy governing these. So school boards can't be silent okay. on how they handle knives and the like. I'm sorry. So I, I see that each local school board shall establish a policy, but you just used the word mandate. So shall and mandate is a little bit different for me. What, and that's what just line me are you looking me. at there? I'm sorry. Um, if I'm in the right section, section 1-4, yep. line 230, 233. And it, it says they shall establish a policy. Mm -hmm. Shall is not permissive. It's, it's, okay. it, it is a command. Okay, gotcha. And it says firearm which is what we understand as a firearm, dangerous yep, gotcha. weapon. And then hazardous object is this, is this class we're creating, which is knives and those kind of things. Yep. So it's got to address all those. I got you on that part. I was just unclear as to whether they have to or thank you. I appreciate your time. All right. Uh, Representative Kendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question, or could you point somewhere in the bill where it talks about, um, I'm having a hard time understanding the process. So um, the police find a knife in the back seat of a car um, and a student is on campus. So can you walk me through like what happens next? I'm trying sure. to figure out where it, does the school board, like do they not get arrested or sure. how that process works? Thank you. Um, we'll have to make some assumptions about what the school board's policy is. Let, let's say we, the, the school board passes a policy that says students may not have any hazardous objects under any circumstances on campus to include cars. Let's say that's their policy. They, they may choose to, to, to parse the, 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 the car and they, they may choose to do it a little differently. But if their policy is as it exists today, um, you can't do it and it's found. A school board would say, listen, this student uh, read our, our code of conduct. In fact, it's, there's language in the back that deals with codes of conduct for, for students. It's, this adds this is something that's got to be in their school code of conduct. Um, they say, you knew you, did, you couldn't have a weapon, even not just on your person, but even in your car. Um, you recognize that you're subject to prosecution for criminal trespass um, if you have a knife in your car. The school board would then say, pursuant to our policy, police come arrest this person because they violated, they, they knowingly violated our, our policy about weapons on campus, so police come arrest the kid. The school board could do that. Um, however, the school board, because it's their policy, um, could choose not to do that. It's, it's this issue of pressing charges. Existing law does not give the school board that authority because they say the possession is a possession of a hazardous object on a school property is a crime against the state. The school board has no discretion. What this would do would allow the school board, superintendent, administrator, whatever their policy says, to make the determination, do we think this is worth, worthy of pressing charges against or do we want to choose not to press charges? The student would be arrested only if the school board and their leadership decided they want to press charges on them. Okay, so if a knife is found in the back of uh, the student's car, I mean, what do the police do, do then? If okay, the, 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 the police, if they knew about it, the police would say, all right, school board, principal, if the principal was designated to make that determination. Let, let's just say, for, for example, that a high school principal is designated in the, in the policy to make that final determination. The, the resource officer would say, okay, we found this knife. Um, do you want to press charges? Do, do, we, do, do we collectively think this is something we want to press charges on, or do we not? We now, because of HB 826, have the authority to make the decision if we want to press charges for criminal trespass, misdemeanor, or not. Um, and they would make that decision whether they press charges. So they, they now, this bill gives them the discretion to make that determination. Okay, but it would happen like right there while the student... Whatever the school board's policy was. The school board could say, hey, um, we're not going to empower our, our, our principals to do this. We're going to convene a tribunal to make the decision within 72 hours. And uh, they'd say, we're, you know, we've collect the evidence, resource officers take pictures or whatever they do. Um, if it were the school board's policy, they convene a tribunal so it's not just a principal making that decision. It's more objective. They could set a policy to do that. But again, that's, that's why this, 
that's the process they would use. And if they found, they, they decided that the possession of that weapon or the knife or the hazardous object in the car um, raised to the level of concern that they wanted to press charges. The kid knew it. There might have been circumstances that warranted it. The school board has the power to make that determination. Sure, go ahead. So, so I'm trying to understand at the, that time that the police find the knife in the back of the car, mm -hmm. is, the kid, is, the, is the student getting arrested then, or are they saying, hold on, let's caucus and see if we are going to arrest you, or just having a hard time understanding that? Let me, let me use an example. If, if, some, if, if someone was... Let me, let me see if this will help. Basically, your bill is removing the state established policy that would require an immediate arrest, and it is delegating to the local school board its own decision-making power to decide if that would be an arrestable offense or not. In other words, a school board could, one, one county school board could implement a policy that looks exactly like the current law and require an arrest immediately if they find a knife. And the next county over could have a, a policy that says, well, if the knife is shorter than six inches, we're going to let the school principal decide whether this is a, an offense that should be followed up with the school board or not. That's exactly right. Yeah. I just right. need to come and clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Wilkerson. Sorry, there you go. Chairman so Wilkerson, can you can you check your mic? You're not coming through at all. See if you push your button or something. I got you on number 26. Oh, let me see. Hello. There we go. It okay. was in the back. It was off. Thank you. Okay. So, under the pol, I guess if a school board sets their own policy, then the policy says they may keep it just like the state and says you'll go to jail. That's one situation. The other situation is. It will be up to a tribunal, or it could be they keep the same policy, but they, they, they could still say, you know what, we don't want to arrest you today. Is that what you're saying? It's, it, it's a, the school board has the authority to decide what happens, whether they press charges for criminal trespass by violating the policy or not. Um, it's a... I, mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say the same thing over and over again. Yeah, no, but, but I'll tell you my concern before you. Okay. I, I say you still have to answer that because I think we're clear. But my concern, I guess, is that say in Cobb County, um, school board has policy that says you can't bring a knife into school. Okay. Have, Walton, you pull up in the parking lot, have the knife, you find it by accident. Pope, you find it by accident. They say, you know what, benefit of the doubt. Policy says this, but good kid. Pebble Brook, South Cobb, you pull in the parking lot. Policy says this, we enforce this. Right. And so I hear that a lot in the community, and I, and I do analysis to see if it really happens. But if we say we have a policy, but the policy's up to how we feel that day, then that would be my biggest concern with having a policy that we really don't follow. So if, if the policy says A or B, whatever that policy is, and I think zero tolerance is not the right answer, but I do have concerns with um, having a policy that can be violated, I guess. And, and, and to the gentleman's question, this bill will not, um, it, this bill trusts school boards. Yeah. This bill does not try to reform the way school boards do that. I, I don't, it's, it's almost an impossible task to, to, to make school boards um, do the right thing. Not, not, yeah. uh, so, so I think the, I think we've got the question I'm asking is: Do we believe school boards should be empowered to make make these kinds of decisions? I believe they Correct. should. D David, I know there's going to be issues, and th people will say it's, th there's unfair treatment, and I, I don't. No one in this room wants that to happen. I, I guess where we are today is school boards have zero discretion to to, to make any kind of determination, yeah. and um, I'm hopeful school board policies will um, be such that it's not a. Um, we're going to have a, a an application of law that's consistent with the common sense of right-minded citizens. I just and I do have a couple of quick questions about the bill, and and I know zero tolerance also in fights, and I and that's where I guess it comes up currently. Um, 
as far as fights happening in the schools, certain parts of the county they go to jail, other parts they get a call home and they work it out some other way. So that's that's the only other concern there. But it sounds like we're trying to ex like break out weapons into multiple categories. You know, kind of clear, give a better definition, like a dangerous weapon, I guess. What is that, a rocket launcher or something it's, to that effect? Or, it's, it's, I mean, it's that's bazooka, basically it's what it's bazooka, bazooka, rocket launcher, hand grenade, mortar. Okay. All right. So when we go through section, real quick, I'll try to do this quickly. Section 1.1, we break it out. And then on line 64, we, it looks like we're restricting instead of weapon, which was all encompassing, we're saying just firearm or explosive compound. So does that, other than fireworks, so does that mean that now the other classifications that we broke out are okay? Because it's saying that, um, and like I said, it's a lot of different wording. So we don't, like for example, when we broke it out, we say a firearm, but we don't say a machine gun or... Um, or a dangerous weapon or anything like that. Thanks for the question. If you will look down, um, what you have there is um, it, it's dealing with firearm. If you look down below, um, the okay, it's, seventy-one. It's, it's, it's called yeah, it's called paragraph. I guess that's sub section subsection. No, that's uh, paragraph three. Is that is that the right terminology, Jill? Thank you. Dangerous weapon, machine gun is is is, is an, an enhanced penalty and fine. Um, so firearm is one thing, bazooka, machine gun is, is a more serious thing with respect to penalties, and it's, that, that's broken out. And, um, okay, that helps. Thank you. And then um, I guess on section 1.4, I guess we redefine, or section 1.3, I guess we redefine it all. Is that? And, and, again, to the? and again, to clarify, um, a, a, a firearm is 2 to 10 years, mm -hmm. felony, felony 2 to 10. Dangerous weapon or machine gun is felony five to ten, um, and a fine of up to ten thousand um, dollars. To answer that question fully, what was, what was your next question? And then I guess we break it out like sections one point three. Is that dealing more with the the students piece of it? Is that yeah twenty dash two seven fifty one? That's that's within Title twenty. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we um, we restate the definition. And then down below in, 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 in paragraph four, you define hazardous object. We, just, we lifted that language out of what was the weapon definition. It's the non-firearm things we put in here under what we call hazardous object. Okay. And how did the PTAs, last question, I guess, you mentioned the school board association. How did the school board association, the PTAs, and the school superintendents feel about the bill? Are they supportive of it? I, I, I was very pleased with their receptivity. I don't, I don't want to say they, they've passed um, their, their quote supporting it. I'd love to hear. Um, I will tell you that there was no objection to the bill. Once, once we added the federal language that, that mirrored the requirement regarding firearms requiring one year suspension, one year suspension uh, they were comfortable with it in subcommittee. Okay, so the other ones are comfortable as far as you know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions of the uh, presenter? I just have a little follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Christian, um, come. Uh, we, we had discussed the question that, that came from uh, Representative Kendrick regarding arrests and whether a person would be arrested for having a knife on campus and so forth. And fortunately, I was sitting right here next to uh, Ms. Travis, who helped me have a better understanding. And basically, uh, at, at lines 261 and, two, and uh, the rest of Section 2-1, what we're doing by this bill is we're saying we're not changing the concept that it we're not changing the law that it is a crime to have a a firearm on campus so with if you have a firearm in your backpack a gun in your car you're still going to get arrested police going to show up right then arrest uh, arrest you and charge you but we are we are in effect, removing from the criminal code or from the criminal sanction process the possession of a lesser weapon, a possession of a weapon as it's defined uh, or as, as, it, as it has been defined. As so, object, yeah. so that it's not, um, it is not in fact a crime going forward to possess a knife on campus, but the local school board can, can institute a policy that says that it is it is the school board's zero tolerance policy that if you have a knife on campus, you'll be expelled. But that's different from 
a criminal sanction of an arrest. So that's, I, I spoke about that incorrectly earlier and wanted to clarify that. Representative Wilkerson? Before. Okay. Any further questions, Representative? I just one more question for myself. Can you tell me what a dirk is? Council? In, in, in all your years of defending bad guys, did you ever encounter a dirk? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I understand, the Chairman, that you're trying to get me to vote for a bill and you don't even know what the words of the bill mean? I mean, come on. <laughs> I have the integrity not to, to lie. <laughs> That's it's it, of course it, we lifted that from existing law. So. I, I'd make a motion at the appropriate time. Okay. What's that? Okay. okay. I, I left it in there because well, it was already in there. Uh, Representative Wilkerson. Could I um, ask a question? I guess in in one more question. In light of in in lines eighty eight through ninety nine. Lines 88, it says the following persons when performing their duties or a route, you know, won't be, I guess, prosecuted under this. Is this like, I guess, like your security, your school security personnel, et cetera? These are the people, these are the people who can carry a firearm in a school attendance zone. Would it, the existing law. Would it be appropriate um, to add in there the, anybody else designated by the school board? Because if... If we pass, it's in the, is it it's, on, on line uh, um, 100 through 107? You, you're you're awesome, man. You know that. I'll just say that. And um, you didn't tell me that. So that would that would encompass 875, correct? Well, well, ex existing law today allows it to happen. So this this issue about the, the schools designating someone to do this. Yep. It exists under, it's, it's available under existing law today. That part of 875 I, um, is, is, was more form than function. Okay, thank you. I'm done. Representative Quick. Mr. Chairman, I didn't, I didn't want anyone uh, not to know that a dirk is a long thrusting dagger. As those of us with Scottish descent knew <laughs> right away, as it's a personal sidearm of Scottish Amen, Highlanders. <laughs> Is there any other questions of the presenter? Hearing none, uh, we'll close off. Is there any other comment from the public? We have. Okay, and what's your name, sir? Come on up, Mr. Weaver. Side representative Sutler That'd here. be fine. Just okay. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for uh, agreeing to hear me speak on this bill. I spoke under the Welch Juvenile Justice Subcommittee on both times that they that he considered the legislation, and that subcommittee considered the uh, legislation. And I would like to ask this committee to consider comporting and amending to conform Georgia law to correspond with federal law in the matter. 18 U.S.C. 922Q of federal law only specifies firearms which are prohibited in school safety zones. Georgia law goes further and, and, and encompasses all kinds and types of weapons, including even a shaving razor. One could be skating on very thin ice, especially if the teacher or principal or whomever had no idea that they had brought it. So in doing this legislation, if it would be favorable to the committee's approval, I would appreciate the committee agreeing to this amended version if if it pleasures this committee and asking this committee to forward it to the floor mr weaver i'd like to pose if i could just ask you a question or two um <clears throat> can you give the the committee an example of where uh the language in the bill would would conflict with good public policy uh for the state of georgia under currently existing law, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, based on Representative Setzler's concerns, uh, the public policy of the state of Georgia already provides uh, specific criminal felonious mm -hmm. intent language under different criminal statutes of applicability, and I think that those statutes are sufficient to govern the unlawful felonious misuse of a dangerous instrumentality 
within the school safety zone. But for policy, especially for many adults such as myself who own common pocket knives and the like, I, I don't think that a person should be exposed to immediate felonious criminal penalties based solely on a mere possession. It's the, it's the criminal misuse of these tools that should expose one to punishment, not just. Sure, I think he agrees with the bill. I, yes. Okay. I, I don't know how to answer that question directly, but that's what I believe. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Weaver. Any questions of Mr. Weaver? Any other questions of Mr. Weaver? Thank you, sir. Uh, is that? Is that you? Okay. Representative Bell. What it does is it, the mandatory minimum of two years for having a firearm on a school zone is untouched. The, the, the mandatory minimum for five years for having a dangerous a hand grenade, a mortar, or a machine gun on a school, that's untouched. But currently, the mandatory minimum of two years for having a pocket knife in a, within a school safety zone, that's eliminated. They, they, they would be pursuing under a criminal trespassing, which is a misdemeanor charge. Yeah. Any other comments from the committee? Seeing none, the bill is on the breast of the committee. Uh, any further discussion among committee members? Seeing none, uh, do I have a motion? This motion do pass and second it by on uh, House Bill 826 by committee substitute 295943S as a, is it a no, it's not. okay in substitute form uh, all those in favor of the bill please uh, say aye. aye all those opposed no bill passes thank you sir thank you Mr. Chairman Mr. Committee with no further business being before the committee, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>